Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Currency Exchange, a NatWest podcast series all about foreign exchange markets. Uh, I'm Brian Dangerfield. I'll be your host today, and along with Paul Robson, who's also joining us from London, we cover G10 FX strategy. Uh, Paul, thanks very much for joining. Well, thanks very much for the invitation. I think uh, last week you said there was quite a lot of drama in FX markets. It um, seemed to be a central bank meeting every day with a little bit more drama. So um, lots to talk about this week. And again, thanks um, for the invitation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm in the Olympic spirit this week. And so we had a bit of a triathlon of big central bank decisions this week with the Bank of Japan, the Fed and the Bank of England all delivering um Certainly interesting and in some cases surprising decision uh, and certainly meaningful market reactions in each case. And so, Paul, I want to start with you talking about the Bank of England. Uh, what did the Bank of England do today and uh, what, do you, what do you think that means for Sterling here? Um, the Bank of England delivered a quarter point cut in interest rates. The first cut from the, the Bank of England since 2020 uh, takes the policy rate down to 5%. So still high really uh, given where uh, current rates of headline inflation um, are at the moment and uh, the decision was um, finely balanced in a number of ways uh, not least because of the vote count the vote count was 5-4 in favour of lowering uh, interest rates at the August meeting you can't get any closer than that the, the four people uh, on the committee had voted for unchanged rates there were five four uh, cutting rates. Uh, and the governor said explicitly for the people who decided the interest rate should come down, um, for some of them, it was finely balanced. And he, he actually opened up the press conference with that line that the decision was finely balanced. So pretty close um, to unchanged rates. And, and that rate cut just comes a little bit earlier than our economics team were expecting. We thought that there would be a delay until November, until uh, it got a little bit more uh, data to um, just to make sure that inflation is um, coming down on a uh, consistent and persistent uh, basis. And of course, over the last couple of weeks, we've had a little bit of news about uh, wage growth uh, in the UK. There were a couple of other things that I thought were quite interesting. Uh, Governor Bailey voted for a cut, um, but his chief economist didn't. Um, of course, there's nothing stopping them from having different views on where um, policy uh, is going, but he's never voted uh, against his chief economist before. So again, it just shows how finely balanced uh, the rate call uh, was. Um, I mentioned some public sector pay increase announcements that have um, uh, have been uh, in the press over the last couple of uh, weeks. Uh, the committee seemed to um, fairly sanguine about that, which I was uh, quite surprised about. They said that it, um, it's private sector wage growth that matters more for uh, inflation. And when they look at inflation on the medium term, it's only a few decimal places on inflation. So they um, weren't worried about it. I was a bit, a little bit more concerned. I thought that they would just want to make sure they, they got all the uh, details. Uh, the finely balanced nature to the decision, I think, suggests that we won't get back to back uh, rate cuts from the Bank of England when we're back here uh, in September. Um, and our economics team think the next cut will come with the next monetary policy report, and that will come uh, in November. And we'll just get a, a gradual uh, decline in interest rates round to a terminal rate of around four, which is still relatively high compared to where we were pre pre COVID. Um, but we'll wait to see how uh, inflation evolves over the next couple of months. Yeah, I think as regards to the decision, two of the things that you said in the podcast last week were watch this difference, potential difference between the governor and the chief economist, which you mentioned was a big one, and also the role of new voters. I think in both cases, you identified those potential risks as something that could swing the balance. You know, that was something that, uh, you know, uh, I think was uh, realized today as we look at the decision on Thursday. Um, what does this all mean for Sterling, Paul, in terms of, you know, we were always thinking about late versus easy easer, uh, late versus early policy easers. You also mentioned uh, the role of the terminal rate here. How are you thinking about all of this as regards to Sterling? Yeah, so we've had this um, positive view on Sterling on a number of uh, factors. The idea that the UK might attract medium term portfolio flows. But we've also talked about uh, late 
cutter from the, the Bank of England versus early eases and a number of central banks. Um, and, and so today's decision um, plays a little bit negatively uh, against that view. Uh, that said, sterling has actually traded pretty well after the announcement, but it had weakened uh, into the event. Markets had gradually become more confident that we were going to get this uh, rate cut. So a little bit of, I would say, buy the rumour, sell the fact. Uh, you were very generous to me just a moment ago in talking about how we saw this dynamic between the governor and the chief economist and new uh, joins on the uh, MPC. But last week, I also talked about how the optics of the Bank of England potentially going after the Fed. Um, clearly, they're going after the ECB, who's already cut rates, the SMB, the Ritz Bank and Bank of Canada. And if I'm honest with myself, the optics obviously don't look as positive as they were looking uh, last week if we thought that um, we'd get a, um, on hold. Uh, that said, the Sterling's correlation relationship with interest rates has been pretty loose over the last couple of months, uh, and it has been for a number of currencies. And it'd be super interesting over coming quarters whether we get that re-engagement. And I'm, when we talk about some of the other central bank meetings this week, it's interesting how we've got a bit of a re-engagement. But for me, the positive Sterling outlook has always been more about that prospect of medium term portfolio inflows on political stability, a better environment for investing. Um, if the UK does attract capital from abroad and it's unhedged, then that should play positive for the currency. And it, and it is an important dynamic because we do have this current account deficit that every day, every week, every month, every quarter, needs to be funded by some kind of offsetting um, portfolio flows. And today's decision didn't really impact that. Uh, I think uh, the growth outlook still is getting a little bit better. Remember, this, this decision today was more about inflation coming low and the persistence of inflation rather than because the economy was weakening quite significantly. You know, there are signs of um, some softening, but it's dominant driver of this decision was lower uh, inflation. So I think I'm sort of having to back into just a little bit more patience in the sterling view, trying to look through some of the near term weakness, but uh, no change of view um, at this moment. But um, like I said, it was interesting from the, the Bank of England. We had one out of three very important interest rate decisions uh, this week, and, and maybe we can uh, turn to those now. Um, the, I think the, one of the most, most important for markets going forward is the Fed. We can talk about the Bank of Japan, who saw quite a significant move. But how are you thinking about the, the Fed after this week's announcements? Sure, Paul. So we were looking at this meeting, thinking about, was this the moment when the Fed firmly put a September ease on the table, yes or no? And when we were speaking yesterday, uh, excuse me, when we were speaking last week in this podcast, you know, I noted that I didn't think the Fed would go all the way to firmly putting September on the table. And while that was technically correct, they didn't go all the way. They walked about as close to that line as they could have without specifically telling us that September was going to be in play. So what am I saying? What am I talking about here? Specifically, Chair Powell said in the press conference that September could be on the table if the data allowed. So he basically went as close as he could to signaling that September is live without specifically signaling that September is live. So technically the view was right, but in reality, they really walked about as firmly a dovish line as they could have without putting September uh, completely on the table. Now there's still plenty of time, I think, for the Fed if they want to be, if they want to pre-signal a move at the September meeting, there is plenty of time to do that still. We have a couple of months more of data to come. We also have the Jackson Hole Conference at the end of August, at which point um, Chair Powell is expected to speak. So there's still plenty of time for the Fed to give that firm signal. But man, the Fed walked about as dovish a line as you could have walked without basically telling the market that September was going to be an ease of the policy rate. And the market has taken that you know, as a clear dovish signal, as I think is appropriate. And interesting as we look at markets, as we uh, you know, as we record here on Thursday morning, that there's actually more than 25 basis points priced in for the Fed meeting in September, a small but still notable 
risk in the market that the Fed considers leading off with a 50 basis point cut at its September meeting. Now, I still think that is a, a, a minority view, uh, one that I don't think is particularly likely personally. Uh, but it is notable that the market was willing to extend these expectations of easing a little bit further that, you know, essentially pricing in almost a policy mistake for the July meeting that because they didn't start with a 25 in July, that they might be in a position where they could consider taking a larger move uh, at the September meeting. So very interesting to see the market sort of pushing in a dovish direction on the Fed. I would say the Fed gave the market permission to do that. Um, uh, they walked about as close as they could to putting September firmly on the table without actually doing so. And I think the market's rightly asserting that as a uh, as a dovish meeting. Yeah, so uh, definitely sounded uh, sort of dovish, like you say, walk, talked uh, a dovish line. It was interesting with Sterling, you've had this loosening between rates and the, the currency. And for some other currencies, it's also um, been the same. So it, given that sort of dovish tone, uh, does it change anything for you on the dollar? I think in some ways it does and in some ways it right? because the market was fully priced for a cut in September. And certainly as we approach the start of the easing cycle, we are also seeing a slowing in U.S. growth moderation in economic data around the, the edges, of, around the edges of the economy, right? Slow down in the labor market. This is just simply not an economy that was running nearly as hot as the data in the first quarter uh, would have led to believe, right? And so the fuel for dollar outperformance comes from not just its relatively high policy rate, but also economic expectations that had been clearly in its favor. That sort of U.S. economic exceptionalism was a big piece of dollar strength, uh, you know, that was prevalent throughout the, a lot of the first half of the year. And it simply feels like that narrative has been falling away. Although in the case of the dollar, as you mentioned, Paul, some of these relationships have not been nearly as strong. So you see, for example, as the economy in the U.S. has shown signs of slowing, economic surprises in the U.S. Uh, clearly slowed, the Fed market has been pricing more uh, confidently and aggressively towards the start of easing cycles. In some cases, you're not seeing uh, material weakness in the dollar that has accompanied that. That's certainly the case for euro dollar, where we're effectively remained in a very, very tight range. Uh, in other cases, you haven't seen it as much as well. That could reflect, among other things, the fact that the U.S. policy rate is still quite high. And it's also a safe haven currency at a time when some risk assets, you know, you think about U.S. equities, for example, have shown some signs of softening here. Um, and you're also heading into a seasonally weak period for risk assets. The month of August tends to be one where risk assets don't tend to perform all that well on a seasonal factor. So there are other fact there are other things to consider as we think about the dollar outlook here, that it won't just be about the Fed, because as you mentioned, some of these interest rate versus currency correlations have shown signs of loosening. But the fuel for dollar upside, you know, the, the, the case for dollar upside uh, has really weakened here. The fuel for that move has been economic exceptionalism and it has been this stalwartly hawkish Fed. In both cases, we're simply moving the other direction. And I think that's been reflected here in a lot of uh, in a lot of these currency moves. Yeah, it's certainly um, interesting developments. And this week we're sort of talking about uh, the Bank of England who cut rates um, a little bit earlier than we expected. We've got this sort of dovish line from the, the Fed. Uh, but the third of the central banks this week are, are walking their own path. Um, they have been talking about a potential need for uh, raising rates, and that's the, the Bank of uh, Japan. It, I think it's quite remarkable that we still have um, a central bank that's sort of moving along that path when everyone else is, is easing. So um, was there anything, um, any key takeaways from the, the Bank of Japan meeting uh, this week? It certainly expectations were uh, super high uh, through it and, and the currency had been moving. Yeah, those expectations were very high and they were met and exceeded. Um, really, I think for FX markets and for the yen, the big question was about the uh, rate hike and the signal around the rate hike. So just to detail what the Bank of Japan did before diving into the FX reaction, the Bank of Japan hiked their policy rate uh, to 0 0.25%, um, up from between 0 to 10 basis points. Um, and in addition, they laid out a plan that was widely pre-signaled uh, that showed slowing of their uh, JGB purchases over the course of the next uh, two years or so. So the expectations for uh, for slowing the JGB purchases were firmly baked into the market, a combination of previous signaling from the Bank of Japan that they were going to outline this plan in July. At their June meeting, they basically pre-signaled it. There was a lot of discussion with market participants by the BOJ that had previously suggested that 
reducing the pace of purchases to around half of the current total, which is what they ultimately decided at this meeting in July, uh, was one that was perhaps the most likely. And so the market expectations, I think, in terms of the scale of reduction of JGB purchases, which is a nominally hawkish decision for sure, was expected. For the currency, however, I think that the decision whether or not to pair this move on JGB purchases with a rate hike was the most important factor. And that's not just because a rate hike is more hawkish and a decision not to hike is more toughish, but the rationale matters as well, because I think the decision to hike rates feels inexorably linked with the value of the currency, that the role of the currency and the weakness in the currency that we have seen throughout a lot of this year is something that maybe finally is taking on a more specific role in BOJ policy outcomes. I, mean, I would say maybe the biggest theme of the year for, for, for the yen in the first six months of 2024 was that Bank of Japan policy was slow playing weak within the yen as a specific driver of its inflation dynamics and as a result, its decisions. We've come into a number of BOJ decisions this year expecting hawkish decisions and expecting hawkish guidance only to be disappointed and see currency weakness on the back of those uh, of those changes. This was the first time this year when the Bank of Japan's decision, I think, met the hawkish expectations and exceeded because they not only hiked the policy rate, they also kept the door open to additional hikes uh, depending on the outlook for inflation. Now, the Bank of Japan was careful to say in their commentary that the currency was a secondary consideration. Uh, but I think it's clear that the value of the currency, the weakness that had been seen, perhaps some of the political pressure coming from, uh, you know, coming from politicians talking about the weakness in currency and the impact that's had on everyday, uh, on, on everyday Japanese people, took on a more important role in this decision. And for markets, that signal is almost always more important than the specifics of the decision. Right? You go back to all the, you know, how many decisions have we come out of talking about central bank bazookas, right? This idea, this, I, this sort of this view that when the central bank tells you that they're changing their reaction function to take, you know, market conditions more specifically into account, they're essentially daring the market to move against those. Um, and a lot of times those types of commitments are effective. And I think what the Bank of Japan did today is move in that direction, signal to the market that currency weakness is something that's more likely to be met with more hawkish outcomes. And as a result, I think that's why this decision had the big positive reaction, not just in the build up to the decision, but also in the aftermath. Yeah, it certainly sets up um, August um, super interestingly for currencies. Like you said, you've got these negative signals for or seasonals for risk assets and, and just coming in to record this podcast i was noting that um equity markets were, were pretty weak bond markets were rallying and and that was having a knock-on uh, impact on currencies and you overlay this with policy uh, sequencing and and divergence and one of the key things we had didn't we at the beginning of the year was uh, economies aren't born equal central banks will um, ease um, at different paces and, and times. And I think as we go through the year, it's um, it's moving past this focus, almost laser focused on that those first rate cuts, the timing to ultimately where are we heading uh, in terms of the policy easing cycle, the sort of we would say the terminal rate in the easing cycle, uh, i.e., where are interest rates going to uh, get down to, uh, and ultimately. That could be really quite important for currencies. Uh, I can just already imagine when we sit down in sort of late October, early November to talk about the year ahead, 2025. I can't believe I'm already uh, saying that. I, I get a sense that that's going to be a, a very important driver of currencies. Yeah, look, and as we're thinking about yen from here on forward. I think it's important to think about not just monetary policy cycles, but also the monetary policy cycle as it interacts with risk assets, with market volatility and with growth. Because, you know, again, thinking about the yen and its price action in sort of two distinct ways. Um, this is not the first time, you know, this is this is not the beginning, I think, of this move in rate differentials in favor of yen. Right? We've had a couple of months now where it's been clear that interest rate differentials have not been a pretty strong driver of dollar yen. And I think a lot of the commentary around the yen move that we have seen over the past month, which has been substantial, um, 
will reflect this idea of a recoupling of this relationship, right? You alluded to it, Paul, that whether or not this is the start of a recoupling of these relationships. Um, but one of the reasons as we look back at the beginning of the year, as we were trying to figure out why interest rate differentials were maybe not giving us as clear a signal on dollar yen, one of the things I think that really stood out to us was this idea that because growth was holding in pretty solidly um, and risk assets were doing generally pretty well, that it was still a pretty good env environment for carry currencies and carry trades um, that are a lot of times funded in low yielding currencies, including the yen. And so even though you had lower, lower yields in the US starting to materialize, markets expectations for some slower growth and easier Fed conditions, those are things that have potentially positive feedback into risk assets and as a result, may lead to things like, for example, lower volatility and greater confidence in carry trades. And I think that's part of the reason why we saw lower rates in the U.S. were not as obviously signaling that the yen should be stronger, simply because when you have lower rates in the U.S. market and lower rates globally, markets are getting more comfortable in easing cycles. That tends to be good news for carry trades, a lot of which are funded in yen. So I think it's probably premature to say that this is a moment where we need to basically, you know, we need to take back out all of the old interest rate differential versus dollar yen charts, which had basically become useless for the first six months of the year, and say that now it's time to to price towards this reconnection. Um, but this is an important, you know, it's an important not just to consider how rate differentials are moving, but how those rate differentials are interacting with other risk assets uh, and the broader risk picture, because you know the yen is a traditional safe haven low yielder. It might be more appropriate to consider interest rate differentials moving in its favor as positive for the yen, if that's happening in a way where other risk assets are weakening um, and it's a more of a reflection of slowing economic growth rather than simply, you know, uh, rates heading lower because we're getting better news on inflation that we're heading for pure soft landing. So very important, I think, to watch not just the pure differentials on interest rates, but what are the underlying drivers of that and how should that be informing our views on the yen? So with all of that, we've covered a lot of ground today. Uh, thank you very much, Paul, for joining it to our listeners. Thank you for joining as well. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider giving it a like and subscribing to our channel so that you get our latest podcasts the moment they're released. Thank you very much. <laughs>